Welcome to episode 256 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brian DeFelice, joined by Bridget Pru and Scott McLaughlin. Bridget and Scott, for the fourth consecutive game, the Bruins had to go to overtime to decide the outcome. Uh, unfortunately for them on Tuesday night, they were once again on the short end of the stick, this time against the Minnesota Wild. So along with the Bruins Wild game and some other um, Bruins news stories throughout the, the last couple of days, let's get right into the opening shifts. Yeah, well, I'll start with that Bruins Wild game, which was a great game. It was extremely entertaining hockey to watch. Uh, unfortunately for the Bruins, it's another third period lead blown uh, that leads to an, to an overtime loss. And, you know, Jim Montgomery kind of downplayed it after a little bit, said, you know, it's happening all over the league. He watched two blown third period leads like in the last couple nights. Um, but did mention, you know, he didn't like that they're giving up slot chances, chances from the net. He thought they lost battles there. Um, you know, I would expand on and say, like, yeah, it does happen across the lead, across the league, but it's happening to the Bruins more than you'd want. They are now 13 1 and 4 this season when leading after two periods, which in terms of winning percentage ranks 28th in the NHL. Uh, that's that's not where you want to be. And the teams below them are Sharks, Flames, Blue Jackets, Islanders. Looking above them at like the Kraken. Like these are either not playoff teams or teams that are like barely hanging in the playoff race. Um, you know, last year I think they blew three third period leads all season that led to to losses. So uh, you know that there are there are teams that are a lot better than them. Vancouver is 18-0-0 this year when leading after two. Los Angeles Kings, 14-0-1. Colorado Avalanche, 13-1-0. Florida Panthers, 13-0-1. Toronto Maple Leafs, 12-0-1. Like, yeah, it happens across the league, but it is not happening this much to other top teams. So I think it's – I do think it's more of a problem than Jim Montgomery is letting on. Uh, I, you know, I think it can be fixed. There's a lot of – time left between now and the end of the season, but you don't like to see it keep cropping up this much. Yeah. And, and he mentioned two of the reasons after the game and one had to do with um, giving up too many rebounds. And uh, the other was, I think he said, you know, sh uh, shots from the slot. Like it, it has to do with how many chances they're giving up in front of their net. And I know this is uh, supposed to go to my opening shift, so I'm going to save the rest of that for later. Um, so my opening shift is something that doesn't have anything to do with today's game against the Wild, and it's what happened earlier this week. Um, Monday, the Bruins decided to uh, send Patra to the World Juniors, and he left pretty much immediately. He's already in Sweden, so he wasn't with the team against the Wild, and he won't be back theoretically till what was it Scott like January 8th or something like that first week of January or like right around there depending on how far Canada goes but I'd be shocked if they didn't make it all the way to the championship just because it's team Canada um and we put up a poll about this this week on Monday asking people you know was it a good or a bad decision and a lot of the answers came back that they liked the decision but I might be one of I'm on the minority side apparently and I have a lot of reasons why it kind of worries me. Uh, so we'll get into that later. But that is my opening shift. Well, you know you're in trouble when you're in the minority, and I agree with you as well. So that's that's probably oh, really that's really concerning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm usually on an island over here, but um, I'm also a non-Bruins Wild uh, storyline I want to talk about. Um, friend of the show, Mark Allred, over at Black and Gold Network. That's who I saw this this media scrum uh, video from regarding. Ryan Mugenau, the Providence Bruins head coach, and basically uh, just, you know, in, in his second year as pro, um, you know, Fabian Lysel, I think, has 17 points in 23 games this year, but Providence head coach kind of said all you need to know about where the Bruins feel he's at in his development, and they're not too pleased with them. I think that uh, – I think he – Mugenau is the eyes and ears for the Bruins, obviously, down in Providence. I think what he says gets – relayed up to to management and, and Jim Montgomery. And, and the sentiment is that while he has a lot of skill, which we all know, there's for some reason just been a lack of buy-in. And the lack of buy-in in Providence systematically won't correlate to Jim Montgomery's system in, Provi in uh, Boston. And the Providence head coach flat out said 
he's not going to play for, for Jim Montgomery if he doesn't buy in. So that's pretty damning, and it's very transparent. You don't hear that very often. So on the one hand, you see that he is putting up some points, but you know there were some questions about Lysel's um, mentality, makeup, I think, prior to being drafted. And I, I just can't help but wonder why someone who's so skilled hasn't even had an opportunity to play his first financial game at all, even if it was just for a quick, you know, for an injury replacement or whatever. And when, sometimes when you have skilled players, maybe they just, there's a reluctancy to buy into to what's being asked of them. I don't know. I'm not watching Providence day to day, but you know who is, is their head coach. So um, I found that to be very, very interesting this week. Yeah. Why, why don't we start there? Cause I mean, that should be, it should be something that maybe other people weren't, didn't see this week. Um, but you want to know who else is always at those games? Don Sweeney. Uh, Don Sweeney is at a lot of uh, games where his prospects play, including Providence, including, you know, hockey East or, te- or, you know, college teams in the area. So he, he knows probably firsthand and has watched it with his own eyes. Um, what he likes and what he doesn't like about Lysel's game. And um, his coach in Providence insinuated really that he's maybe a little bit too selfish still, and he hasn't done all the maturing that he needs to do in order to, be a team player and play in Montgomery system, which I think that's what I took from saying like he needs to buy in. And then he also made a comment about at the end of the game, he's trying to go one on four. Uh, So kind of sounds like he maybe is trying to do too much himself and he needs to play more of a team game. So uh, I found it concerning because you don't often hear a coach call out a guy like that. Maybe he's trying to get a response and maybe he's trying to wake him up. But this is the Bruins' only first-round draft pick that they've had in a while. I and mean, they traded one for Lindholm. They traded one for Bertuzzi. Lysel is the first-round guy that they needed to hit on. And the fact that, you know, what if he's a bust after all of this is really not something that Bruins fans are going to be um, huge on. I know Don Sweeney's done a lot of good things over the past few seasons to get the Bruins as good as they've been. But you need to hit on a first-round draft pick. Uh, and if Lysel can't, because we mentioned this before too, it's not like he's super young anymore. Like he's had time in the system. He's had time in Providence. Uh, and he, you know, I think what you were saying too, I, not to take up too much time, but Brian, when we were talking to, who was the person that we had on for the, for that draft? We had a guest. Chris Peters. On, yes. So we had a guest, we had him on for that draft and he was saying what some of the concerns were with Lysel, which was during COVID, he was inconsistent when he on his team in Sweden. So there were questions, and that's why Lysel ultimately fell a little bit down in the, where, where the Bruins took him. Yeah, so uh, I asked Don Sweeney about this on Monday um, when Sweeney met with the media, and Sweeney was at that game on Sunday, um, which was the game that prompted – uh, Mujanel's comments and Sweeney, you know, I think was doing a little bit of cleanup with his answer and, um, you know, trying to downplay it a little bit saying that, you know, he, he had a good start early in the game. He did also score in that game. He actually, he scored Providence's only goal. He nearly set up another one with a great play going to the net um, and set up a teammate who had, I think either whiffed or defenseman got a poke check in. Um, and then Sweeney said, you know, but what he's specifically referencing, managing, managing the game and having an understanding. And then Sweeney made the point of like a lot of offensive players do this. And he mentioned Brad Marsh and David Pasternak. offensively inclined players are going to go through that. They want to do more. Sometimes it's just about maintaining within the team structure and executing. And that's something that Fabian and all young players are going to continue to go through. Um, so I don't I don't know if you guys saw the specific play. Another friend of the pod at the Bruins Network on Twitter um, tweeted out like the exact yeah, play. Uh, that's and, Anthony yeah. Anthony Quitkowski. If, if you know if that's his real name. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he uh, has a real name. No, he's just the Bruins Network. That's yeah, that, that's his whole name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he he tweeted out the exact play that Mujanel was talking about, and it's it's a delayed penalty. Lysel is like the trailer on the rush once they get the extra attacker on. 
and enters the zone with a ton of speed, gets basically past like the first line of defense, and then tries to drive to the middle, basically through two players, and loses the puck. The Providence Bruins actually do end up getting possession back um, and setting up. And on the surface, it's like you watch it and you – it doesn't look like that bad of a play. Like it looks like a, a talented player in a six-on-five situation with his team trailing three to one in the third period trying to make something happen. And on the one hand, it's like, okay, like he he should be trying to make something happen. He's arguably the most talented player on the team. Um, and they have a, you know – a man advantage with the extra attacker on during a delayed penalty. On the other hand, like I completely understand the frustration of, Hey, he went, you know, one on four or one on two or however you want to break it down and almost loses possession when what he probably should have done is get in the zone, pull up and set up a six on five attack where you can potentially get a better chance than him trying to do everything himself. And so I think to me, like when I hear Mujanel's comments, it's not so, it's clearly not just about that one play. It's something that's been building. And this seemed like sort of just like a tipping point of frustration that boiled over after the game that he went public with, which, you know, from my interactions with Mujanel is like, not his style. He's usually a very positive guy. Um, so it seems like they've probably talked to him about this before of like, you know, you got to have more awareness of the game situation. You got to be willing to use your teammates. You got to know, you know, when to attack and take guys on and when to, to care about possession and, and make plays that allow your team to maintain possession. Um, you know, it's, in some ways it's, similar to some of the criticisms we've heard from Jim Montgomery about Matt Potra when he's been asked about benching him in the third period and he references game management. Like, I think these are similar things of young players not really adjusting their game to the, to the situation, if that makes sense. So um, that's kind of how I read it. And, you know, as far as like the bigger picture of Lysel being, potentially being a bust or whatever. I think it's, I still am not willing to go that far. Like he is for the most part, still having a good, not great season in Providence. Um, You know, and Bridget, you're right. Like he's, he's not 18, but he is still 20. It's not like he's 22, 23. So I guess I, I would say it's concerning, but I'm not panicking over this. Yeah, well, I think that this year there was a lot of opportunity to be had for for Lysel in training camp. There was there were spots up for grabs. He didn't come anywhere close to sniffing one based on his camp. And so now he goes down to Providence and you're hearing from his head coach that he's just he's just not buying into a professional game and he's still playing pond hockey out there. And yeah, when you have the skill he does, pond hockey can give you, you know, the points that he has so far. But I don't know. I, I think that he's going to have to force force their hand to bring him to the NHL. And it seems like he's kind of nowhere near that right now because of, again, not because I'm saying this, but because the, the decision makers, his employer are saying this, it's his head coach, it's his GM. And, you know, Scott, what, what Don Sweeney said, I mean, yeah, I've never heard Sweeney try to, you know, smooth something over before and not be transparent or be political. So I guarantee you hundred percent sarcasm. I guarantee, I guarantee Sweeney, you know, probably has the exact same message in his mind that uh, Mujanel does and Montgomery probably feels the same way. So he's saying one thing, but they're all on the same page. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that we haven't even seen him get an opportunity. You know, someone goes down, the offense hasn't been, jumping off the page this year, especially if you're not David Pasternak. So there, there's still opportunity there, and he's not – it doesn't sound like he's anywhere close to getting a call-up anytime soon, um, even if there were a bunch of injuries. It sounds like they'll probably plug and play Oscar Steen and, you know, just whomever. So 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think Jesper Boquist was. I mean, was a yeah. call up before like, him. He, not not that one. Jesper Boquist is a bad call up because you know he's somebody that you identified in the off season as someone you want to bring in, and he has NHL experience, and he's not twenty. So, um, and yeah, I don't want to sound like I think that they should, that they're giving up on Lysel yet because they're they're not and they shouldn't. Um, but I think this the frustration is is there because. They know he is such a like so much of a higher ceiling. Like they they identified him as a top six player. Like he's going to be a winger, or they identified him as a winger that could play on your second line, maybe even your first line at some point in the future. So it's kind of like Brian when when you're like a little bit down on Lindholm because you know that his his potential is higher uh, than what it is, and and I think they expect a lot from Lysel. So those comments, you know, kind of come from a place of we know we can do more because, you know, we know what kind of a player he is. We just need him to buy in. Uh, <laughs> and they th- then maybe things will start going a little bit more towards him looking like he's ready for the pros. I It just seems like he's further away than we thought he would be at this point, I guess is the, the concerning part. Well, and, and also Chris Peters, that's who was on with us a few years ago. I, I believe he, he made a comment along the lines of, Lysel may be the most talented forward in that. I have to look back at who the draft class was, but he was saying he was one of the, he was probably one of the more talented forwards in the first round, but he dropped to where he did. And so, and of course, like he said, there were some character things. I'm wondering if he's a likable player to coach. Um, is he somebody who well, you know, have- slams, slams his stick against the boards or, or, you know, hangs his head when, you know, when coach tries to discipline him? I don't know. It's unfair for me to say, cause I don't watch. I'm just trying to, think as to why because you're right scott it's not because of one play that mujanel made these comments it's it's a culmination of you know a lot of little plays like this so I, i'm thinking does the does he not like the player and i don't know i'm not really sure well there was a little bit, only we don't know behind the scenes really with him too much but they did have on behind the b in the off season they followed him in sweden with pj axelson who is one of the people that helped identify him as somebody for the bruins to target and he seemed very likable he seemed pretty mild mannered. He seemed like he was working hard on getting, you know, putting on weight, getting strong. Um, he seemed like he was really working his butt off to try to get back in the in the mix for a call up at some point and try to get ready for training camp. His problem was we and we've gone over this in the past. He was coming back from a concussion, so there wasn't all, as much on ice stuff that he could do. But he was still working to you know to get heavier and. I think, I mean, from what we saw with that, he came across as, you know, a pretty likable person. And you also, yeah. Scott, you did a one-on-one with him during. during... Yeah, I've, I've, I've always found him, like, pretty likable. Like, I, I don't sense that there's any sort of attitude or anything like that. Um, I don't know. You know. I don't know if you guys would have seen that on Behind the B or in a one-on-one, though, Scott. True. You know, a but lot of I times competitive things are out. But I think the character issue that – had been like referred to didn't have to do with like a negative personality. I think it was like maybe just getting, getting a little bit flustered and I, we, we saw him once he got fatigued. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, I think part of what we had heard was he was like, when he went up to kind of like the pro level in Sweden, he was frustrated that he wasn't playing more. Um, You know, so that's, I don't know. Maybe it's like somewhat related. If you want to draw a parallel of like, Hey, did he, did he buy into doing what was best for the team or whatever? But also like, I I don't have a huge problem with a guy and a kid in his draft year being upset that he wasn't playing more. Like that's, I I bet that's probably like a fairly common thing for an Mm -hmm. 18 year old who's, you know, probably thinks he's in a really good situation and then he's not getting the minutes or playing in the situations he expects. And you can't, you don't have as much chance to like showcase your game. So, uh, you know, to me with like the, this Mujanel thing, like I, it reads to me not necessarily like some sort of overarching character concern. It's just they're trying to get him to recognize game situations better knowing when to attack, when to take guys on, when to maybe play, you know, a little more conservative or a little more of a possession oriented game. And 
they're frustrated that he doesn't that doesn't seem to be clicking or he doesn't seem to be able to identify those situations because again like i could see how on the surface you'd look at the situation and be like this is the time to attack this is the time to try something we're down three to one in the third period like what am i going to get conservative for but you have an extra attacker and you have a chance to set something up in the zone so i also understand like the frustration of like why did you go one on four in this situation when there was an easier path to possession? Yeah. I mean, he's, he's going to, he's going to adopt a more NHL caliber mindset, just like, just like Jake DeBrusque in overtime, um, shooting a puck 15 feet over the net on, with, with, with two defensemen in front of him and Charlie Coyle going to the net instead of going off the pads for a rebound, he shoots it 20 feet over the net into a three-on-one the other way. Very smart play. I think Lysel should take some notes there as well. Yeah, I mean, we, I think we've probably covered Lysel enough. So, yeah, we might as well transition to this game against the Wild and might as well start right there because that was it, – it's amazing to me how many poor decisions this Bruins team makes in overtime. Like, I think it was only an episode or two ago that I mentioned how, like – every other team seems to value possession in overtime and the Bruins just like charge ahead. Like, you know, they're going to lose if they don't score in the first 30 seconds. And they just like give away possession on guys trying to go one-on-one. And in this case, DeBrus taking a, taking a bad shot. Like even obviously it's bad because he misses, but like, it wasn't even a good shooting position to score. If he gets it on net, it, it's like how like what's going through your mind there like how do you settle for that shot you know three on three it's like you got to look for openings and and like seam passes you don't just charge into the zone and like fire a snapper from the high slot like it's it's wild and you know and i do think montgomery obviously was asked about it directly and was like yeah, I don't like that he missed. I don't like the shot selection. And he also didn't like that both DeBrusque and Coyle were, like, charging to the goal line. And by the time they turn around, the puck's already carrying past them, and Matt Grizzlick stranded on three-on-one. So, yeah, just all, all around bad bad decision-making there. It's, I think it's been a problem for the Bruins in overtime all season, but in this specific case, yeah, for Jake DeBrusque, not good. Well, and you can tell that it's not like they practice that very much. Like they look like they don't practice it very much because there were times. I mean, they, like, they practice three on threes. I sit there and watch it. Like, well, yeah, but like something's not clicking with it. It's not like there's certain reads where I, I know it's easy for us to say and we're not on the ice and we see it completely differently. But from above, you know, we have a different vantage point and you can see when plays develop when guys are getting caught too deep and like I'm up there thinking, Oh man, that's not going to end up good. And it always ends up in an odd man rush or a breakaway. And there was one point in, in the overtime where geeky should have seen the guy behind him. And the guy, I forget who it was. I can pull it up, but went on, went on a pretty clean breakaway because instead of him noticing that, uh, the I forget it might have been Marshawn was going to take a shot. He, he should have dropped back, and that's when that's when they they gave up the breakaway. So I don't I don't know. It was from our vantage point, it looks bad, and the same vantage point that you see on TV. No idea what it looks like on the ice for those guys, but um, sometimes you can see it coming, and you're like, oh, I know what this is going to turn into. Yeah, I mean the the actual game winning goal was. It was so elementary not to take the shot that 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 DeBrusque did. I mean, you go back and watch it. He crosses the blue line, and it's comical. It's comical. The shot selection is comical. The the misfiring is comical. Um, it's like, did you, did you think, did you think that was gonna go in? And like, if you're gonna take that shot, like I said, and I know Montgomery said Coyle and DeBrusque were both going to the goal line, but it's like, if you're gonna take that shot, which you're not scoring from there, you might as well just get it low for a rebound where you have a teammate at least going to the net. It was just, the, it was, it was one of the dumbest, one of the dumbest shot selections I've probably seen. Um, 
I don't want to be, be dramatic, but I'd probably say in my uh, my entire life. Um, but the, the <laughs> you, you've been a uh, you know very sarcastic and a little bit dramatic today, Brian. I know it's late, but yeah. Well, um, the one thing I didn't like even more so than that in the game was the Pat Maroon hit on Charlie McAvoy and Scott. I know you were up in arms about this and just you know just be consistent. Is I think that's all anybody's asking. No one's no one's saying that. Yeah, that that that's that's, that's there's no no one knows. Well, we all know watching like what uh, what these uh, these hits should be, um, but the refs just don't. And and the fact that a, a penalty is not even called in this situation is just I'm not even looking at this with with black and gold glasses on because uh, I seldom do. But it's just like how do you not call that a minor? Like it just makes no sense. And then it, what's even what's further frustrating is like you look at the Bruins tonight and you look at Minnesota's bench and they got like four or five guys that would, you know, easily, you know, fight anybody on the Bruins team with their eyes closed. And it's just like, it, it, like that's, the, that's like your, one of your best players, one of the best defensemen in the league. And the Bruins just don't have the personnel in that moment to really kind of step up besides Frederick, but he fights out of his weight class a lot. So it, it's, I'm kind of like annoyed, not even so much that like the players inability to do so. It's just, it's just the reality with this Bruins team. They're not like, they're not, you know, they, they celebrated the – I'm going to mess this name up again, Scott. What was it called? Something AC Club? Tech lunch Club? Lunch Pail AC. Lunch Pail AC. They've come a long way since 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 the Lunch Pail AC guys they celebrated the other night. But Yeah, now, um, I mean, now we call it Lunch Boxes. I don't I, – Yeah. We call it, you know, not Lunch Pail. <laughs> so I, I didn't I didn't like the hit for the same reasons that, Scott, you'll, you'll go into. Um, but it, it also just is frustrating knowing that this Bruins makeup just isn't what it was in, uh, in years past to kind of help rectify – and police the ice a little bit more, more when their well, star players get hit. Yeah, I mean, so two kind of two things here. For, first off, on the hit, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how inconsistent from night to night, hit to hit, this league is. Because, yeah, that was a hit directly to the numbers. Like, hit from behind as clear as day, like as obvious as it gets, and there's no call. And then it... it like I tweeted it and it's it's like there's a pie chart with three slices and on any given hit from behind, they just spin it and yet a third a chance that it's going to be no call third a chance. It's going to be two minute minor and a third a chance. It's going to be a five minute major in a game misconduct like David Possum got. And it's like, there's just no consistency across the league from night to night. You can watch other games and see it. And I don't know. I feel like a broken record. Like I've been on this for a while and I don't know how the league fixes it. I don't know if they care. It doesn't seem like there's been any effort to clarify anything or take these hits more seriously. So I guess they're just going to keep allowing it until someone gets seriously hurt. You know, someone, gets knocked unconscious on the ice, maybe they might start taking it seriously, but it sucks that like, it's probably gonna have to come to that. Um, as for the response, it's a bit unfortunate because I actually thought this was a game where the, for the most part, the Bruins showed, uh, you know, we've used, Brian, I know you've used the word snarled. Jim Montgomery used that the other day, talking about his defense, especially. Um, I thought this was a game where the Bruins showed a lot of it. And, there were two fights. Jacob Lauco dropped the gloves, scored a decisive win, got the crowd all jacked up. And he he is one of those guys who can fight. And he said this week was the first week he got clearance to be able to fight after his facial injuries. Um, Parker Weatherspoon fought after, you know, he threw a, hit, a hard hit on Marcus Johansson. Maroon challenged him, I think. I think Weatherspoon has some toughness, but he's probably out of his weight class fighting Pat Maroon. I guess, you know, good for him standing in there, taking a couple punches. Um, but yeah, it was like after the hit on McAvoy, it was almost like the, he kind of got the sense that they picked trying to win the game over getting revenge and jumping them or risking an extra penalty or whatever. And obviously the irony of that is they also didn't win the game. Um, so you, you come out of it looking like you didn't do either. If, if you 
hold on and win the game, you can say, hey, we're facing you again on Saturday. We'll get you then. Um, but as it is, you you kind of let Maroon off the hook after that, and you end up losing the game. So worst of both worlds. Yeah, and I don't really have anybody that that can really make Maroon kind of pay anyway, which is kind of my other point. Obviously, we know um, Lucic would have been that guy, but it's just not the, the reality for this team. And, uh, yeah, I just – I just think that, you know, obviously I think this team is missing a little one key, you know, playmaker up front. We all agree with that. And, you know, when when somebody takes liberties on one of your top players, is is Trent Frederick going to be enough, whether that's the regular season or playoffs or things get chippy? I don't know. But I do I do know that there are – I'm not saying this necessarily equates to, to success, especially in 2023, but – I personally think it does. I do think the tougher a team is, like it, it, it does benefit them. And I think that the, I don't think the Bruins are. I, I just think they're a team. I don't think they're any. They're certainly not tougher than many teams, and I don't know if they're any weaker than others. But they're just they're just a team. And so um, that was evident tonight, Scott. Like, yeah, they they lost in the score sheet, but also they don't really have anybody to do that. Like Trent Frederick, maybe, but that's even that's that for him. That's that's punching up a little bit. Yeah, well, Maroon, most people are punching up to Maroon <laughs> and Ryan Reeves. Like those are those are guys that I don't think anyone in the league wants to fight. And like you guys already mentioned, Witherspoon did. I mean, he, he lost miserably and he kind of he kind of got jumped a little bit. Um, but Witherspoon, my, my the point I want to make is about uh Witherspoon coming up, and we talked about what the depth chart looks like behind you know the original top six defensemen on this team and was it going to be Mitchell was it going to be Laura I don't think anyone really had Witherspoon on the radar but he's been playing I think this three games in a row for him and he has jumped people because he is bigger he is I guess willing to mix it up if if need be um he's you know he's more physical he's bigger he he has something that Ian Mitchell and Mason Laura don't bring and it's something that the team is missing now. Can he handle Pat Maroon? We saw no, <laughs> but he did answer to was actually a, a hit that he made on one of the wild. But I think he's an he's in addition of physicality and toughness. He might not be you know the the biggest addition, but he is an addition to that category, and and that's what they've been looking for. Yeah, and it was it was wild talking about him that Montgomery specifically mentioned Sonaro because he said you know he brings some of it, and I, I think Weatherspoon's been playing well. Like he, he, you know when he came up earlier this year, when I think I think it was like the when McAvoy was suspended and Grizzlick was injured, like he was up for a couple games then, and at that point to me he just just he looked like just another guy. It was like all right, he's he's a placeholder once guys are back, he goes right back to Providence this time around. Like he's, he's playing some real minutes. He's kind of moved around playing with different partners. He's played left and right side. And I think there, there's some physicality there. I think he's moving pucks quickly. Um, he's obviously clearly not like a dynamic offensive player. He's not going to give you much on that end of the ice, but defensively, I think he's doing the job and, um, you know, it looks this time around like more than just a placeholder. And, you know, when they keep him up over Ian Mitchell, like uh, given how he's playing, that makes sense to me. Even putting him in the lineup over Mason Laura, it's like in, in certain matchups, depending on what you're looking for, I I absolutely think he's been better defensively than than we've seen from Laura. He's he's more of a one for one for Derek Forbert, who's you know who the Bruins are attempting to replace while he's on IR. So you know Derek Forbert isn't the best offensive player for the Bruins. He's a guy that can eat penalty kill time. He's a guy that can block shots. He's you know Weatherspoon is more comparable to Forbert, uh, who they you know who they've been without for a while than Lori or Mitchell is. Uh, so Scott, your your opening lead was basically uh, just another third period blown game for the Bruins. Now, 
a um, couple episodes back, I, I discussed how I felt like the, the Bruins record being atop the league. Um, I just didn't think that top to bottom that they're as good of a team as their record indicated. And I think that, you know, you illustrating, you know, all those teams, Colorado, Florida, Toronto, you, you list off a couple of other top teams where their, their record after having second period leads is pretty much impeccable. Whereas the Bruins isn't um, that little things like that. I feel like kind of are indicative of like the Bruins, maybe despite being with those teams in the standings, maybe just being a step below them top to bottom. Obviously goaltending is great. Defense is good most nights, but um, do you feel that that's an accurate uh, takeaway from that stat? Maybe I, I, to me, I feel like the bigger problem is that they, it just feels like they get too conservative when they have the lead in the third. And part of it stylistically, it seems like they, they sag back. I mean, the second period tonight, like they were playing great and they were pushing and they didn't add to their lead. Like it was still two to one after two in part because, you know, we've barely mentioned him so far, but Mark Andre Fleury was excellent for Minnesota. Um, was the only reason the Wilds still had a chance in, in the third period. So you got to give credit to him. But even in the third period, is like once the Wild took the lead, you saw the Bruins push again. And and like to some extent, that's na- kind of natural. But to the other, it's like, all right, like look, look at these things. Look at how well you were playing in the second period to hold on to a lead. Look at how well you played after falling behind to come back and tie the game again, at least force overtime. Like why did it get so conservative in that middle stretch at the start of the third period to open the door for the wild to come back? And that to me kind of feels like the issue over and over. And I don't like, I don't know if that's a style thing. Like it is Montgomery trying to have them sit back more. I also think this is where like you could point to some personnel decisions, like, shortening the bench and, and sitting Potra a couple times where it's like, it's, it seems like the strategy at times is just protect the lead and play defense and hunker down. And they're not pushing enough to extend the lead. Um, I don't know that, that like, I, I don't know that it's necessarily that they're not good enough to be able to hold on to leads. I kind of think they're just not, playing the right way when they're trying to do it. Well, I noticed a definite tide change in the third period when, so the Brusque drew a penalty. The Bruins went on the power play, didn't score on the power play. So successful kill for the wild ended up pretty much immediately springing this momentum shift where all marks forced to make this huge kick save. And then all of a sudden there's one shift, two shifts, three shifts in a row in the Bruins end of the ice and the wild are buzzing and they're around the net and they're getting multiple opportunities. And for me, that was really the turning point and that they scored the two goals after that. Um, and old Mark had to come up with some incredible saves in the third and he did. Uh, but sometimes the pucks just loose for too long and they're not clearing it out, or maybe they missed a clear in the first place, you know, or to try to get the puck out of the zone. Um, you know, maybe, maybe it's a mistake like that, that starts the, the flurry of chances, but that's really what, what happened midway through the the third period was as soon as the Bruins got done with that power play, there was, you could feel that's when the momentum changed. And in terms of cleaning up pucks in front of the net, I, I wouldn't say that Linus Allmark was at all the problem in this game, but he did take accountability in his post-game press conference and he did blame himself a little bit because someone came straight out and kind of bluntly asked, um, you know, why, why are you guys giving up leads like this? And he said, it's because I I've given up too many goals. I'm frustrated with myself. Um, I shouldn't, you know, I should have those. So he did take some accountability there. Uh, even though, I think most people would agree he was not the issue in terms of why the team gave up two goals in the third and ultimately lost in overtime. Yeah. I mean, I think to Scott's point about the Bruins playing conservative, I think that might be because they don't have the, the personnel uh, up front, I think to score. 
like they did last year. And I don't, I don't know if they feel like they can, they can afford to play run and gun open ice hockey. Not, not that that's what you want to do anyway, when, when you say to play assertive, but may, maybe they just feel like if we're in a situation where we, we have a lead, we feel like we're fortunate because we want to protect that lead now. As a, and I just like last year, they, they played with assertiveness and confidence, like no, like no other because they knew that they could score. Um, if somebody, the biggest thing with the Bruins last year was um, if they were scored against, like you, the, the Bruins would give up three or four goals in the game last year, sometimes five. And like watching the Bruins last year, you were like, yeah, they'll find a way to get six or seven if need be. And also if, if it, if it was a one, nothing game, like you knew the, the Bruins could play that style too. But I just feel like the Bruins don't know if they have the same, well, they know they don't have the same personnel as they did last year. So maybe there's some of that going on as well. Yeah. Not for nothing, but they had a lot of opportunities that, I mean, Flurry was keeping the wild in that game for a while because there were some really great chances by Pasternak to almost get a hat trick several times. Zaka had some really great chances. It They were generating a lot of good high danger chances for themselves. And by the way, that we haven't even touched on them yet and we probably don't have time because we still got to get to Patra, but that JVR geeky Frederick line was doing a lot on the ice and they were getting a lot of chances for, and they didn't have many chances against them when they were on the ice and geeky had a few really nice looks and, you know, they were generating chances. Flurry was keeping them in and, you know, maybe they, they missed a few shots wide, but it, I felt like they were going to extend the lead to two goals at some point in the second or, or early in the third period. And it just never happened, but it wasn't for lack of opportunities. Cause I can remember so many that were so close. Yeah. And just last thing I'll say before we get to Patra is Bridget, you mentioned like the, the slot chances and chances in front. And like, that's what Montgomery highlight as well. And it's, those become more likely when you're spending too much time in your own zone, because any coach will tell you like the longer a team has to defend, the more likely they are to start to make mistakes. And so for me, like that comes back to the Bruins aren't getting out of their zone enough. They're not spending enough time in the offensive zone when they have the lead, they're getting too conservative. They're doing too much defending. And when you get pinned in your zone for a 45 second shift, like mistakes are vent no matter how good your structure is, it's gonna start to break down. Guys are getting tired, and that's how you end up leaving someone alone in front for a rebound or a slot shot or whatever it might be. All right, so we have our final topic to talk about this episode. And Bridget, I'll throw it back to you because it was your opening shift, and it has to do with Matt Potcher being sent or loaned to to Canada for for World Juniors. Yeah, so I, I had noticed in, uh, you know, our poll, we actually got quite a few responses. It was 411 responses, I believe. I'm pulling it up right now because for some reason it kicked me. Okay, so 411 votes. The question was, do you think the Bruins made the right choice sending Matt Potro to play for Canada in the World Juniors? 84% said yes. And I retweeted this, I quote tweeted this, and I said, you know, I personally, in my opinion, think it's not the right thing to do. People, you know, there was this one guy commenting, I commented on it, which made me laugh. He's like, it's not about your opinion. I'm like, it, it's Twitter, bro. Everything on here is like, it's, uh, I put it out there as my opinion because I just won't, you know, and well, who cares what I say? It doesn't matter. But um, so I'll give you guys these specific reasons why I was against it and well, I am even more concerned actually after some of the comments. So um, I, I wrote down some of the things that I felt were most relevant from Don Sweeney talking about sending Patra, uh, which he, he came out and talked Monday to the media after Bruins practice when it was announced. And uh, so he was selling it as like, there's no downside. Everybody wants to go play for their country. Like Patra wasn't disappointed. Like he's not disappointed, but he's also he also wants to be in the, in, in the Bruins, like with the Bruins. So, you know, it's kind of a pros and cons thing for him. Like he has to be, have some sort of a con conflicting feeling about it. Um, but this is the main part that concerned me from this comment. He said, he'll have to earn his right. Just like he did coming out of training camp uh, to start 
in our uh yeah to start in our our lineup so like I almost feel like and they did call it a reset like I almost feel like they're making him try out again. Like I, th- I'm just concerned that when he comes back, is this not like did he lose that spot? Because Geeky played really well as third line center, and, and Potter, we haven't seen him play wing, and it's just a little bit concerning to me that it was worded like he has to earn his right the same way he did out of training camp. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah. The- That didn't really so much bother me because I just think it's a statement of fact. Like you have to earn your job every game. You know, there's, there's no, you don't win a job and then keep it all year, no matter what, like, no, but has had to earn that every time he's stepped on the ice. So. Yeah. Yeah. But like out of training camp was like, there was more uncertainty to it. And I almost feel like we've gone back to a place where his spawn in the lineup is once again, uncertain. And it's just, it concerns me because I didn't think he was do like, I didn't think he was playing bad enough to lose his job to Morgan Geeky. And, and, you know, who knows? Like he, he mentioned like he feels more secure going to world juniors because he knows he'll be, he'll be back with Boston. But sometimes when you go away and someone plays really well on your spot, you know, you have to be concerned about that. Um, you know, someone can steal that spot away from him. And Geeky's been playing well there. So, you know, for me, it just changes the dynamic and it kind of signals to me that they are not as high on him as maybe they've been saying they 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 are. Something's weird about it. It it just gives me this vibe that something's wrong, like something's off, and we're not I, getting the full story. I disagree. I think they're still very I know high you on disagree, them. but let's yeah. get Brian's opinion because he agrees. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I like a lot of what you said, Bridget. I mean, if I'm Matt Patra, I I don't even want to give anybody an opportunity to to take reps from me. Like what you said is very true. And this is kind of separate. Like, so whether whether or not you think that they're still high on Patra or Scott thinks they're still high on Patra, like um that one I, I don't know if I have a strong enough opinion to to weigh in on just yet. But but what you just said a moment ago a moment ago, I, I I think is very, very true. And I think that if I'm at Potra, that's something I should have. If, if this came down to to Potra, at the, like like kind of like really t- telling the Bruins like I really want to play in this tournament, that's very short sighted of him because you never relinquish your spot on an NHL lineup. Because to your point, Bridget and Scott, right? You have to earn your job, but it could be taken from you. And and if you're if you're if you're around the team, uh, it, that's less likely to happen. So. I have I have a con as well as to him going to World Juniors, but I'll pause there and, th- and throw it back to you guys. Yeah, I think I agree that like yes, it could go sideways if if the twelve forwards who play while he's gone all play well and the centers play well, and there's no obvious spot to put him back in. I and I realize this is a little bit of a cop up, but I also kind of think like things kind of seem to take care of themselves like that we're talking nine, 10, maybe 11 games down the road. I don't think the Bruins have had a stretch of 10 games where everyone stayed healthy yet. So chances are someone's going to be injured, whether it's a center or even if it's a wing, it's very, becomes very easy to bump geeky over to the wing. And then Pacha's spot is there. Like, I don't know. I think we're focusing on a problem that's, three weeks away at minimum. And there's a really good chance that it's not going to be a problem by the time we actually get there. I think it is though. Like I, we're going to disagree on this. Like we're not going to, it's not, there's no like resolution coming. Like we're, we have two different opinions and they're both, you know, valid for their own reasons. And clearly I was in the minority, but um, one of, one of the things I want everybody to pay really close attention to in the weeks that Potter is gone is the comments made about Morgan geeky. And because I heard Montgomery say, I believe Tuesday before the games, either Monday or Tuesday, that Geeky is a natural center and he's looked better playing center than he has at wing. So like pay attention to the comments made about whether or not he wants to play Geeky at wing or wants to play Geeky at center. And what's most beneficial for Geeky might be what really is an issue 
for Patra getting his coming back and, and play, being in the same part of the lineup. And look, uh, so it's not a total one-sided conversation. There are pros to sending him to World Juniors that I'm sure people will 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 list. And Bridget, it's probably littered in the comments about you know him, you know, taking on a leadership perspective or a leadership role with 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 uh, Hockey Canada, with him playing in every situation, going down and and scoring and, and gaining confidence. Which, by the way, let's not assume that that can happen because it's a tough tournament and maybe he doesn't score, but that didn't would hurt happen his, for Lysel. That would hurt. Year. That would hurt his confidence, but these are all. And then of course, appeasing the player's ability to go represent his country. Those are all things that people will list as pros. Fine. List them all if you want. And we can list some of the cons that Bridget mentioned as well. For me, this is all kind of like the biggest con in my mind is, is, and I, and I, I talked about this online, but it's quite simple. If he gets hurt, and again, Scott mentioned like we're talking about something that's three weeks away, and I'm talking about something that might not might not happen. I'm also talking about something that is a possibility. He blocks a shot off the foot. He's out for two months. Like the fact that the Bruins are allowing him, who Matt Potter, who's supposed to be a top three center for them, even have point zero 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 one percent of getting hurt while playing for another program not called the Boston Bruins, to me, is irresponsible for for. for for your asset or for your player like the that i just i just i i can't shake that 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 thought and people people rebut that with me and say he can get hurt he can get hurt in practice with the bruins he can get hurt in a game with the bruins and if he could go to providence which we all know he can't he could have gotten hurt in the providence game so so risk is always there of injury it's like well thank you guys i appreciate that very very obvious statement the difference here is that he's not playing for the Boston Bruins or a Bruins affiliate. Like he's playing for another hockey program. And if he gets hurt playing for said hockey program, that injury wouldn't occur had he not been playing for said hockey program. So for me, that's really the only sticking point to me. Like Bridget's points are great. Scott, yours are too. If he gets hurt for any extended amount of time, God forbid, like the Bruins, because this risk should have been there, like they should have known this in the first place when sending them, like, that to me, like, should be heavily criticized. You cannot jeopardize um, an important roster play so, this year. So. Oh wait, that I got one more con. <laughs> it has to do with what Brian said, and it's Zaka is healthy today, but if you go down another center, you're stuck with you know that lack of center depth. So it's not just about if Pacha gets hurt; it's about if one of your other centers gets hurt. Well, and Zaka was just injured. I uh, just came back for the first a game back against the wild. So it's, it, you hurt your own team by sending away your center depth. If something happens. Well, I mean, one silver lining, like if that were to happen is it would allow you to call up Georgie Merkulov, who has been playing really well. And, you know, it, like for a few games that that's a pretty nice reward for a kid who's having a really good season in the AHL and has bought in, defensively and made improvements there that you've asked him to. Um, so not overly concerned about that. I'm not overly concerned about the injury because Brian, it's obvious, but yes, he can get hurt anywhere. I would say he's less <laughs> likely to get hurt there because it's, he's not facing as many older, stronger physical players. There's less tolerance for bad hits. We, we just talked about how, awful the NHL is at pol policing hits from behind. IIHF has like zero tolerance for bad hits, whether it's from behind mm -hmm. or to the head, like you get ejected immediately. More like college, the way yeah, they, they rest exactly. is much more like college, no fighting, no, you know, well, nothing, that, nothing like that's, that. That's, that's all totally fair. I mean, but, but what I'm like, I understand that it's, it's not as physical, but hockey is like hockey is a physical sport. All I'm saying is like I said, it could be, 0.1% chance, which by the way, is higher than that. But you, they should, I guess my point is you shouldn't even allow that, that chance to be there. He's a, he's somebody that they have in their plans for this season, a season that the Bruins are contending as we all discussed. So like, I just, I'm not saying it's a big deal. I don't think he's going to get hurt. I'm just saying it shouldn't even, it shouldn't even be a possibility. Am I, am I wrong in thinking like, just try to avoid risk at all costs? Well, I, just think that, I just think there's always risk 
period. Like there it's, is, but not, but <laughs> the, I, I know, I know, but, but at least if he's doing, if I mean, he, this he, while he's with his employer, he got, that's hurt. he got hurt his last game in Boston. Like, yeah, but he was playing for the Bruins, but he was playing for the Bruins. That's what I'm trying to say. He was playing for the team that you're, that's paying him. Like, like, yeah, you can roll your ankle on a sidewalk walking down the seaport. I get it. But like the difference here is that you're getting hurt while playing for the Bruins or pre- like, that's the difference here. Yeah. yeah and my understanding from well, the Olympics, things- has, the, the Olympics has the same risk, by the way, in those years, that's also something that teams talk about. So what I'm saying yeah. here is valid, but sorry, Bridget. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that um, it, from trying to like read between the lines because, you know, they haven't straight up come out and said who was the last decision on it. It seems more than likely that this was a decision that the Bruins made. It didn't, Matt Potter didn't come out and say, I was pushing for this. Um, they never said that he was pushing for it it seems like an organizational decision. It's not like he was like, guys, I'm itching to go. Like he mentioned that back in the summer, he was really looking forward to it because he didn't think he was going to be in Boston. But now that he's in the NHL, he said, you know, you, you never want to leave the NHL. So it sounded to me like this was a, a, a decision made by management. Go get a reset. Cause that was one of, uh, this is the quote, uh, he'll have a chance to mentally and physically have a little bit of a reset. It, I mean, I think it's their decision, which makes it makes Brian's case a little bit better. I, like, I think, I think it was collaborative. Like, I think they, they well, all think talk had it through. To agree to it, but it, I mean, but he's going to do what they say. Elliot, ultimately. Elliot, Elliot Friedman mentioned on sports that I think um, there's been situations in the past where, if an NHL team is going to loan one of their players of age to, to world juniors, oftentimes they kind of have a conversation with that program saying like, all right, we're going to loan you an NHL caliber player. Like we want, like we want to get some benefit out of this. And oftentimes that's like, make sure he's got a letter on his Jersey, make sure he's playing that leadership role, make sure he's playing in all situations. Like, you know what I mean? So like, I'm sure there was some of that going on too. Maybe, maybe not, but like, I mean, for 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 a world junior program to get loaned an NHL caliber player, that's huge for them. Um, and I don't think that they're taking that for granted. So maybe there's some gamesmanship going on there too, um, to make his experience well worthwhile. And um, yeah, I mean, I think so. At the end of the day, Bridget and I preferred him not to go. Um, you know, I don't, I I don't think that he's going to get injured. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't like the the, the possibility of it. Yes, yeah, Scott. Yeah, I I also think. First off, I want to say, like, I, I feel like I've buried the lead on myself because I actually pushed – I said on our last episode, like, I would have kept him, and I still feel that way. I haven't changed. Like, if it were just up to me, I would have kept him in Boston. Um, I'm just not as concerned about it or think it's that big of a deal. Um, and I do think there are real positives to sending him. And one of them they just touched on is that leadership. Like, I think – young players learning how to lead among their age group is really valuable and can help develop them into leaders in the NHL down the line. Like Patrice Bergeron being a leader on the Canadian world junior team in Oh four, the lockout season was very valuable. It was kind of like the first signs of like, okay, this is someone who has like, is captain material at some point down the line. Um, you know, Char- so Charlie, Ma- it's so, Charlie so McAvoy, Mac- Matt Grizzly, like led for world juniors. Like, and I think they would tell you that was extremely valuable to their development. So, you know, Potter was going to be a leader for Guelph this year. Had he been there, whereas last year he was still, you know, sort of in like the middle of that roster in terms of age. Like this was the year he was going to be a leader on that team, but he blew right past that. So this is this was sort of like the one opportunity left to have him be a leader among you know his peers um, and get him that experience, which I do I do think has real value. I I think that the main thing that we're saying is the comment that Don Sweeney made, and I think we can all agree on this. Comment that Don Sweeney made to start the press conference, which was there's really no downside. 
is incorrect. Like there is downside. There's there's the upside, which Scott has been talking about, but there is downside. Okay, so there like, is. That's where we disagree. I, I mean, a little. I I kind of do disagree with you guys. Like I, you I don't, don't think there's any downside after listening to what very, Brian very and I just said. We just listed all of the things that were down that that could be bad. <laughs> I think there's very little. There's, there's definitely there's... not no downside. Well, he but be- he better go down there and break Connor Bedard's scoring record because if he goes well, down, if he, do I'm obviously I'm kidding, but if he goes down there and he and he goes like pointless, like that's not going to help his confidence. Do I expect that? No, but there there is potential downside, just like there's potential upside for for somebody to not acknowledge that is playing politics, and obviously Sweeney would never you know admit to that, but. Um, Okay, so we have gone a little bit long. It is late. Scott, do you want to mention uh, Friday's episode while we're still still together right now? Yeah, so Bruins uh, are off until Friday night, but our next episode after this one will be dropping Friday morning, and we're going to do another mailbag, one, one more before Christmas, uh, so people can send us questions at the Skate Pod on Twitter, skatepod at wei.com by email. Or comment on the YouTube video if uh, if you watch on YouTube, we'll go through those. Um, yeah, and then that'll be probably our our last episode until after Christmas. I know they have games Friday and Saturday, but you know we're probably not recording Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, so which I think people can. We don't understand. want to record Christmas Day. Uh, no, <laughs> I want to. I want to drink a lot of eggnog Christmas Day. That's what I want to do. Yeah, it's okay. Eggnog field podcasts are fine. <laughs> I really need to add our email address onto this graphic. So um, I'll do that. I'll do that soon. All right. Yeah. So we're looking forward to that episode. It's always fun to, to interact and engage with everybody's questions, comments. And, and yeah, those are the honestly some of the funnest episodes. So um, thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you very soon. Hey guys, thanks for watching this gate podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.